the month of June is filled with great solemnities and feast days, which uh, are focused on our understanding of God's revelation, or in other words, we, we kind of go back to the basics in celebrating what we believe. And today's solemnity is no exception. Today the Church celebrates the solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, that ancient uh, revelation that has been held as sacred for Christians from the very beginning, that God is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we know it's ancient because even already in the earliest of the New Testament writings, which are the epistles of St. Paul, dating back to somewhere in the year 50 or early 60s. Already then, we hear Paul greeting people, greeting Christians in the Trinitarian way. As we heard Father James proclaim the second reading, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. A greeting that has uh, continued to be used in the liturgy of the church to this day. Yes, it's true that our understanding of this mystery about who God is as one God in three persons has continued to evolve in the life of the church. But that teaching and that revelation has been present from the very beginnings. Some would say that the mystery of the Holy Trinity is one of the most difficult ones for us to comprehend. And rightly so, because we're speaking here about the very nature of God. To understand who God is exactly, for us to fully comprehend it, is certainly a challenge because our minds, our understanding, is clouded by the effects of original sin. And so there are many things that we can't fully comprehend, and yet this mystery of our faith, as other mysteries of our faith, are to be accepted by faith, simply because on the grounds of trusting the one who speaks them, rather than trusting ourselves who are able to understand it. This is really one of the foundational ways in which we approach our lives as Christians. When it comes to the truths of our faith, we always have to approach them with that sense of trust in God rather than in ourselves. When we can fully understand it, then the trust is placed on us and our ability to understand things. But when something is given to us and we can't fully comprehend it, when we still accept it, we are really making an act of faith and trust that the one who speaks to us is worthy of being, uh, being trusted. The mystery of the Holy Trinity really reveals to us not only who God is, but also who we are called to be. Because after all, Again, one of the most ancient understandings of who we are through revelation is that we are made in God's image and likeness. And so today, rather than diving into um, the discipline of theology where we try to understand God in the Most Holy Trinity, I'd like to rather dive into the discipline of spirituality and ask the question, what does it mean for me? What does it mean in terms of my own way of being and living and growing? How does it affect me? Because I think this is important for us to know that the mysteries of faith, the revelation of God is given to us not so that we can feel somehow, you know, smart and, and above everyone else because we can understand things, our ability to understand is not what allows us to receive salvation. You see, salvation is given through faith. When we say we believe, we accept. And in some way, we're able to implement what God has revealed to us into the way in which we live. That's why in the seminary, they often tell us that theology is to be studied on our knees. 
So in other words, what that means is when you're studying something that God has revealed to us, make sure you're able to incorporate it into your lives. Or in other words, ask yourself, what does it mean for me? Is it meaningful for me? Does it apply to the way in which I live? Does it give me an insight into what I should do and how I should view reality and even myself? Does it point towards a pathway that I should take? See, these are more practical questions that I think are essential. And so we dive right in by asking the revelation of the Most Holy Trinity, what does it mean? How does it influence my life? Well, it influences my life because if I understand that the way God is, I am called to be because I am created in God's image and likeness. Then I begin, uh, I begin to see how it really applies to my own spiritual life. The first reading speaks about God revealing himself to Moses and it speaks in terms of, God speaks in terms of relation, his relationship with his people. It's very interesting that God sees himself as being first and foremost relational. And God says to Moses, I am the Lord. I am God of mercy and gratefulness, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. All those, all those attributes of God of faithfulness and mercy and love and faithfulness have nothing to do with God's relationship with the whole, within the Holy Trinity, but everything to do with God's relationship to his people. Because after all, who needs God's love? We do. Who needs God's forgiveness? We do. Why do we need God to be slow to anger? Because we fail. And so first and foremost, God reveals himself as one who is relational, who wants to reach out to us in this gracious and merciful and loving and faithful way. It's interesting that in the second reading, St. Paul speaks also of this relationship, but now he speaks of our relationship to one another. Based on the way God is with us, we are to be with one another. And so St. Paul says to the early church of Corinth, he says, live in peace and love one another put things in order, agree with one another, be saints, and love God. It's interesting that the way God is towards us, we are called to be towards one another. But this still doesn't answer the question, how does the Holy Trinity, one God in three persons, how, do, how does that truth help us to understand how we are to live? Well, again, if we begin to read the explanations of what the Holy Trinity is, then we will begin to see how it applies. So let me just give you this much. God the Father begets the Son, who is called the Eternal Word of God. And theologians tell us that the best way for us to understand how the Son and the Father exist is that the Father thinks of his own divinity and in so doing the thought of his goodness and beauty and love begets the Son who is now the eternal thought of the Father. But because God is being itself, unlike us, our thoughts do not bring about life, but God who is life itself and being itself, his very thought now becomes personified. And so the Son is referred to as the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit is referred to as the will of God or the love of God or the movement of God in the relationship between the Son and the Father. Are you confused enough? The reason I bring those up is simply to point out these two things. Within God, in the Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the relationship between the three is based on the mind and the heart. The thought of God brings about and begets the Son. 
and the will of God through lo his love, the movement of the heart between the Father and the Son, now beget the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. And that's where we begin to see how this can apply to our everyday life. Our relationships, the way of existence, the way of looking at each other has to always include the mind and the heart. The movement of the mind, our ability to understand and think proper things is very essential in our relationship with God and with one another. But there is also the movement of the heart associated with the Holy Spirit. And that is also essential for us in how we relate to, the, to God and how we relate to one another. We often think of the mind and the heart as movements of thinking and feeling. And both are essential if we really want to live in the spirituality of the Most Holy Trinity. God the Father thinks and begets the Son and through his love for the Son begets, not begets, but generates the Holy Spirit. And so is true with us. So often I think we make the mistake of overthinking things or overfeeling things. Have you heard that? In the court of law, in the courtroom, often people who are too closely associated with a particular crime or with the person are not allowed to testify. Why? Because they are overly involved in terms of their emotional uh, involvement with the person or the situation. If there is too much feeling, too much heart, and not enough thinking and rationalizing, then we can lose our objectivity. But also, if all we can do is think and we become intensely focused on being rational beings, but we have no ability to engage in the, in the situations with our feelings, with our heart, then we can also miss out. We can lose our ability to feel someone's pain, to be with someone who is suffering, to simply try to overcome someone's pain by reasoning through it and telling them, why won't you stop crying? Why won't you stop feeling this way? You see, we are made in God's image and likeness. And as God the Father, through His eternal thought and eternal feeling or love, is presented to us and exists as the Holy Trinity, we are also to live in that perfect balance and blend between thinking and feeling, between affectivity and uh, our uh, ability to understand. And so I want to uh, just leave you with that today. It is not so important for us to understand why God exists the way he exists, why God reveals himself to us in the way he does. What is more important is to ask, what does it mean? How is this revealing something about the way I am called to be, to live, to see, and to grow? Another little um, thought that comes from that and that can be helpful is that God the Holy, in the Holy Trinity is one in its nature, in his nature, in the divinity, but he is also distinct in terms of persons. We say three persons, three distinct persons. And each person has a particular role within the Most Holy Trinity. God the Father creates, God the Son redeems, and God the Holy Spirit sanctifies. And so again, the role of the Holy Trinity and the distinctiveness of the three persons in the way in which God relates with us and engages with us also reveals something about the way we are called to live because we are called to participate in the work of God. So just as God the Father creates, we are called to participate in the creative work of God. Just as the Son redeems, we are called to participate in the redemptive work of God. And just as the Holy Spirit sanctifies and purifies, we are called to participate in the sanctification work of God. Or in other words, we all of us are called to be creative, we are called to be redemptive, and we are called to be sanctifying. Not only within our own lives, but in the way we relate to one another 
be creative, to be redemptive, and to be sanctifying. Notice this fits so beautifully in the way in which the gospel is preached. We are not called to unfairly criticize and point out faults and, and destroy people. We are not called to dismiss people in ways that really doesn't help them at all. But we are called to approach individuals, people, God and ourselves in a creative way, which is so beautiful. Creativity has given us so much beautiful music and art and so on. And so we need a creative outlet as well, everyone. But also in the redemptive work, which is to give hope to people that they too can receive a great hope and life and also in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit notice the early Christians were called saints or in other words people need to know that they are called to holiness and we can share in that great call of the Holy Spirit to create to redeem to sanctify to approach people with both our understanding and our heart all of that is given to us in the revelation of God in the most holy trinity and we pray that we may be open to it in our lives. Amen. Amen.